Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the White House. Uh, and for those of you viewing online, welcome as well. Uh, my name is Aaron Hannigan, and I work here in the Office of Public Engagement uh, at the White House. I want to be the first to welcome all of you uh, and especially thank our champions of change who are here, who we are here to honor today. If we can just start with a round of applause for all of them. Uh, we're looking forward to a great event with our champions, uh, and I would encourage everyone to learn more about our champions today by going to www.whitehouse.gov forward slash champions. Again, that's www.whitehouse.gov slash champions. Uh, now, before we begin our discussion with our champions, uh, we have some special guests. Uh, first up is my boss, John Carson. Uh, John is Deputy <laughs> Assistant to the President and Director of the Office of Public Engagement. John? Thank you, Aaron. Welcome to the White House, everyone. Uh, welcome to folks following online, to our audience here, but most of all, of course, to our incredible champions of change who are here today. Um, a lot happens here at the White House, a lot goes on in federal government, but little that we do here is as important to us and is as exciting, frankly, as our Champions of Change events that we do every week, which is a reminder that whatever is going on here in D.C., whatever the debates of the day is, every day across this country, millions of Americans are making a difference in their own community. Millions of Americans are bringing people together, finding solutions, making change. And that's what the Champions of Change program is all about. We've had uh, many other Champions of Change events, but I have to say um, this particular Champions of Change event and the work that you do, I think, is so impactful. Um, people who are literally working to save lives in their own community. And I haven't asked for all of you. I haven't asked for all of our champions. I haven't asked for the people who are here in the audience and those of you who are online, which is tell the story of what you saw here today. We need your help in expanding the network of people who understand that they too can be champions of change. They too can make a difference. Um, with everything that goes on in our country right now, people need that reminder that there are neighbors, there are friends, there are coworkers who are making a difference every day and especially to our champions, tell that story. Tell how you got involved. Tell about the coalitions you've brought together to make your communities more resilient, more prepared, safer. Because you will inspire others to believe that they can do that. You will inspire others, inspire others with specific actions that they can take to be a part of it, to be a partner with the federal government, with agencies like FEMA. And, um, and you will be that spark that can provide and expand this network of champions of change that we've created. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce someone who is just an incredible member of the President's Cabinet because of the experience she brings to it and the work she does every day uh, to keep our country safe, quite frankly. But someone who understands what you do every day, who understands the importance of what happens at that local community and how to make the federal government a partner with that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Secretary of the Department of, Department of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. Well, great. Thank you, John, and welcome to all of our guests, uh, including those of you watching online. Um, each week through the Champion of Chains program, the White House honors the remarkable contributions of individuals and organizations who make a real difference in their communities. Uh, we know that some of the best ideas for how to promote positive change in our country don't come from Washington, D.C. They come from our fellow Americans who are working on the front lines in their states, in their cities, and in their communities. The Champions of Change program honors the amazing work these Americans are doing, and today we are pleased to have 16 local leaders with us who have been spearheading creative and effective initiatives to better prepare their communities for disasters. In the process, they are helping to build a more resilient nation and a more secure homeland. Now, we all know that disasters can strike at any time, uh, anywhere, and all of us have a role and a responsibility to be prepared for them. Over the past year, we have seen more billion-dollar disasters strike our country than ever before in our history. Uh, they include devastating flooding, the deadliest tornado outbreak in over half a century, the first hurricane to make landfall on our shores since 2008, 
and thousands and thousands of smaller disasters that impacted lives and communities each day. Being prepared for these and other unexpected events is critical. Knowing what you would do if a disaster struck your home, your business, the school where your children attend, uh, knowing what to do can save lives. Having a disaster plan also can help local businesses and economies bounce back more quickly, which is key to a community's long-term recovery prospects. The men and women we are honoring today know this better than anyone. They're doing the difficult work in their communities to promote preparedness, and in the process, they are changing lives. Take Abby Solomon, who we're honoring today on behalf of her late husband, John Solomon. John was a longtime advocate for emergency preparedness. He was tireless in calling attention to ways that individuals and communities can better prepare for the unexpected. John was a valued voice in the emergency management community, one that we were very sad to lose. And Abby, we would like to thank you and your family for his service. His daughters are here with us as well. Let's give a separate round there. Let me, if I might, give a few other examples from today's champions. Uh, Chad Stover of the Arkansas Department of Emergency Management helps coordinate the Arkansas Citizen Corps program that trains citizens and volunteers for disasters across the state. There's uh, Mark Benthian and Brian Blake who have organized public earthquake drills known as shakeouts to help Americans from all walks of life get ready for earthquakes. Last spring, I was fortunate enough to join a class of students in St. Louis to participate in the Great American Shakeout, their shakeout drill. And then only months later, uh, many of us experienced our own earthquake, the real thing, right here in Washington and indeed up and down the East Coast. These and other champions here today show us the impact that a dedicated group of individuals can make before, during, and after a disaster. You are all our heroes. And on behalf of President Obama and the entire Obama administration, I want to thank you for your tireless efforts to make the country safer, to make our communities stronger, uh, and to help peoples of all walks of life. You have set a remarkable example for your fellow citizens to follow. And in the process, you've helped us uh, build a stronger, more resilient country. Uh, you have done for others uh, so much, and we are so very, very grateful. So on behalf of the President, on behalf of myself, and on behalf of the entire nation, congratulations. Now I would like to inter introduce Rich Serino. Rich is the Deputy Administrator of FEMA. FEMA does more on the ground every day across our country to help the nation prepare for and respond to disasters of all types. Uh, and they've had to be very uh, agile this last year. At one point uh, during the year, we had um, major federal disasters pending in 28 different states. Uh, it, was, it was one of those years. You all helped and helped a great deal, and FEMA was uh, on its toes the whole time. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Rich Serino. Thank you, Secretary. It's a truly a pleasure to be here. Every time I get the opportunity to come here to the White House, I probably, like you, pinch myself and say, what am I doing here? And I know what I'm doing here today. I'm here to say thank you. Thank you for what you do, because you make a difference in people's lives. You really do. How many people and how many jobs get a chance to do what you do is truly make a difference in people's lives. You do. And for that, thank you. Very much appreciated. As we come here today and honor the folks that are standing here, and unfortunately, someone who couldn't be here, 
We are also honoring and recognizing the work that everybody, everybody in this room, everybody online, all the first responders, all the emergency managers across the country that make a difference in people's lives. And probably the most important people that make a difference are the citizens, ordinary citizens that take the time to help their neighbors. Neighbors helping neighbors. That's really what it's all about, is really neighbors looking down, looking across, looking up, neighbors helping neighbors in their most critical time of need when people have lost probably everything that they have, when people need a hand that never asks for a hand. And even when they don't ask for a hand, the neighbor that comes there and helps pull them up in their time of need. And the work that you do does that. So I really want to say, again, thank you. And I also want to just take a minute to remember somebody in the emergency management community that passed away earlier today. Richie Shera, who was the Director of Emergency Management in New York City, 9-11, led the 9-11 response, did a lot of other things around anthrax when that happened in New York City, passed away this morning. So I just want to remember him as we recognize all of you, as we continue to move on to help each other. So next on the agenda is now we actually want to learn from you. As the secretary said, you know, probably not the right building to say this in, but some of the, the, the best ideas, you know, certainly do come from the street, come from people on the front lines. Not many of the good ideas come from within it's called the belt. <laughs> okay, maybe a couple. Watch yourself. Yeah, watch myself, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and before I came here, I spent my entire career in, in Boston uh, for um, 30, 60 years uh, and, and came here two, two and a half years ago, and, it, and it's been great. And I believe the best examples of how we can help further emergency management, help further save lives, comes from people on the street. And so we'll have a little bit of panel discussion now, and hopefully all of us can learn from you. shoehorn here and go. squeeze right in. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. But it, it really is great to be here and to, to take this opportunity. Um, and, you know, I have a, a number of questions here that I'll probably use a couple of them, um, but probably more get into a discussion and, and really want to hear from you. And we'll, we'll start with uh, Chad Stover, who's the Deputy Branch Manager of the Arkansas Department of Emergency Management Homeland Security Branch coordinates the Arkansas State Citizens Corps program. Next is, and please forgive me when I met, mess up all your names, uh, <laughs> Mark Benneth? Benthian. Benthian uh, is the Executive Director of the Earthquake County Alliance based out of California. Brian Blake is the program coordinator for the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium based out of Tennessee. Herman Schaefer is the director of the community outreach at the New York City Office of Emergency Management and co-chair of the New York Citizen Corps Council. Carolyn Bloom is the emergency management coordinator and community relations specialist for the Denver Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Martin Mikowski is the outreach coordinator for the American Red Cross of Greater Chicago. Mike Ripley is the Disaster Response Manager for the NBC Universal Emergency Services and runs the NBC Universal Community Emergency Response Team. And Abby Solomon is here on behalf of her late husband, John Solomon, creator of In Case of Emergency, Read Blog. 
um, and I was interviewed uh, a couple of times when it was in New York. And um, mentioning New York and Boston, we, we won't go too, the, too far there on some of the issues uh, between New York and Boston and the sports teams. And um, as far as what happened in the Patriots in Denver last week, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Not really, but, you know. <laughs> Tim's a good guy. I like him a lot. But he is. He is a great guy. <laughs> you know, Tom's a little better. But, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, wait till we get to New York. Uh, Chad, uh, just on, uh, with the Arkansas State Citizen Corps, uh, how do you harness the volunteers before, during, and after the disasters? Well, uh, you know, most all of our programs are uh, volunteer driven, and probably one of the most important things is to recruit, you know, volunteers who want to be there and who are really passionate about doing this. And I think across the entire Citizen Corps spectrum, we really do a good job of doing that. Uh, for us, we uh, have instituted, you know, sort of a single. Uh, place to sign up for being a, a Citizen Corps volunteer or being a CERT volunteer, and it sort of gives them one place to get information. Uh, we have 22 Citizen Corps councils throughout the state, so we feed that information. So as the state office, we sort of play that coordinating role and, and getting them information and getting them volunteers. Uh, in the past four years that I've been with the agency, we've had 12 federally declared disasters. Uh, and those range from flooding events to evacuations to 125-mile tornado tracks. Uh, and so we use those volunteers quite often for donations management, for search and rescue, just going by and checking on their neighbor. Uh, but really, that, that core uh, volunteer, that core prepared person is checking on the person next door, making sure that their family is safe. And that's really where it starts. So those are the messages that we get uh, to our volunteers to try to uh, get it beforehand so they have the information, know what to do when the disaster happens, and then how to help after it's done. Now, one of the issues I, I hear a lot when people talk volunteers is people really want to help during the disaster, like everybody wants to help during. Right. And then Citizen Corps people, well, yeah, right, I'd like to join it, but I don't have the time to do it ahead of time. I, I don't, you know, I, I really don't want to make that commitment. I'll be there when, when the emergency happens, but I really don't want to prepare for it. How do you, how did you get people involved? Well, you know, our, our local Citizen Corps councils are really where the boots are on the ground, and they know their communities really well. Uh, one of the, the interesting things that we see are uh, our volunteer fire departments, which the majority of our state runs on volunteer fire departments. Those are also the people that we help train and cert. So they're, they're families, they're teachers, all of those sort of auxiliary people in the community who know what's happening. Those are the ones that come in to, to help. Whenever we see... Um, you know, people who, who don't really have the time, one of the initiatives that we're going to be working on for this next year is to sort of do a shortened CERT training uh, type activity that's, you know, maybe four hours or eight hours to give them the highlights so that, you know, they don't have to spend, you know, five weeks in class trying to get a, a 20, 25 hour course. Uh, and it really does allow them to be able to respond to it uh, so that we have trained volunteers, ones who actually know how to help and not necessarily sort of be in the way. Uh, all volunteers are good and we need them, so we just need to be better at plugging them into to our message and being prepared. Great, thank you. And I'm, depending on time, we'll come back because I have no like problem. 10 questions I want to ask. <laughs> and if I don't ask you here, I'll ask you afterwards. Um, and for, for Mark, how does the Earthquake County Alliance use its public awareness campaign uh, to reach the whole community and, and drive the public from awareness into action? Well, you know, uh, I'm fortunate to work for the Southern California Earthquake Center, uh, an NSF and USGS center that is this broad community of people from across the country working together. And we took that to create this Earthquake Country Alliance where we, from the beginning we wanted to include as many types of people as possible, not only the emergency managers, but the scientists, the engineers, and also the local, uh, you know, people in their communities from the very beginning. And that then spread uh, to the beginning of the great California shakeout where we said, how do we include everyone in a drill, like the whole community? Uh, and from the very beginning, we, we really worked hard to make sure that everybody could see their place in such an activity. Uh, and it was connected in with a big exercise that might normally happen, but we wanted to say, let's have five million people, and that just sounded crazy. 
But in that first year, we were able to have that many people participate from schools to uh, uh, business organizations like NBC Universal and, and other uh, awardees here. And, and I think from that perspective of opening up, have everybody be able to participate in something and make it easy and fun for them to do so. Um, it's been really amazing to see how other parts of the country have wanted to pick this up, like in the central U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, so it's been really um, rewarding to be able to work with so many type of people as well. If, if you could pick the top, like, two or three things that really helped get to that five million people, what, what was it that really get the people to get involved, say, yeah, that's well, a good thing to do? Certainly the, uh, a big start and, and a big part of the shakeout um, everywhere is working with schools. So, and we really had this vision that the schools, the students would be able to go home to their families and share what they're learning. And, and maybe one day, that, and, we, and we, this has actually happened, we've heard stories of the kids go home to say, we had an earthquake drill today. And the parents say, so did we at our business on the same day. And they able, are then able to have that conversation about what they need to do at home. So that's what we're really trying to, to uh, bring forward in that change in the culture of preparedness. I think they, getting kids in school and yeah. bringing it home um, it's amazing what the kids can get you to do that nobody else can get you to do, you know? <laughs> and that's not when they're just young, by the way. That's even when they get older. Um, for, for Brian, the Great Central U.S. Earthquake uh, Consortium sponsors a shakeout exercise that involves the whole community. And tell us a little bit about the Central U.S. part. Yeah. Uh, before I start, maybe uh, I'd like to say it's a great honor to be here uh, among all these other uh, panelists who are innovators and leaders in disaster preparedness and also to represent QSEC on the behalf of our board of directors, staff, and the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, which is really uh, one of the big big drivers behind things like the shakeout. Uh, you, we, you've been in Washington how long now? No, nope, <laughs> never. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, the reason I ask that is you used an acronym. In, like, in Washington, you have to talk in acronyms. So oh, the QSEC, so just for those <laughs> yeah, who may not the, know what that Central is. Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium. Great. My organization. Uh, so the ShakeOut, though, is, is basically a broad-based public outreach campaign uh, designed to teach people what to do during an earthquake. And we do this through grassroots uh, outreach, traditional outreach media. Um, we use a lot of... of techniques like Mark talked about, uh, really getting in, in the schools and, and getting them involved. In the central U.S., we were successful uh, through, through a lot of innovations that they did in California uh, with, the, with the shakeout that started with the Earthquake Country Alliance. Um, we used, uh, we, we didn't use, we partnered with, with state emergency management agencies uh, in 11 states in the central U.S. to, to ultimately reach uh, more than 3 million people uh, with, with earthquake related information in a place that earthquakes aren't really a topic of a, a daily topic uh, amongst the community. So we, we, did, a, we did a whole lot through, um, through, through the centralized website where we encourage people to sign on, register, and show that they're doing something towards uh, getting prepared. And it's, well, yes? Uh, the next shakeout is February 7th, uh, 2012, if you're interested. In it's February 7th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what, what would you say was probably the, the biggest barrier, the, the biggest problem that you encountered during, um, during this whole process? I would say, I would say getting started was, was one of the big problems. We had tossed the idea around for a long time with our, our partners at the states, but once they they took it on and they saw that, that we could reach a lot of people. They, they really ran with it. We had uh, almost 10,000 drills, individual earthquake drills go on last April. Uh, for instance, in Indiana, we had close to 600,000 uh, people participate in the drill. Almost half of the students in K through 12 uh, participated. So once we got over the initial barrier of trying to get off the ground, we were able to really see some good success. And that was all uh, due to our partnerships with our states. So you, somebody more or less saying, let's just do it to start and get in was That's the it. biggest barrier. Now, if somebody wanted to get involved on February 7th, 
Yes, what, what uh, we, we encourage everyone to go to shakeout.org slash central US uh, and sign up to register. And it's, a, it's basically uh, just a two minute commitment to do a drop, cover and hold on uh, activity, which is the recommended activity prote to protect yourself uh, during an earthquake. So, and, and two minutes will be well spent for those of us that live through an earthquake here in D.C. <laughs> that grew up in Boston where we don't have earthquakes and we weren't sure exactly what to do. Um, trust me, taking that will, will help out. Not that any of us did that. But. <laughs> um, New York City is the, the home to many diverse communities. Uh, Herman, how is New York City Citizen Corps Council working to engage the whole community preparedness? Sure. Um, let me just also reiterate how much of an honor it is to be here uh, with all these great folks and just to learn from each other because I think that's something that's really important for this process and also to be able to move forward with a lot of things. Um, as you said, New York City is incredibly diverse and it has, you know, you know, 8.4 million people. So it's, it's a lot of people we're working with and a lot of different ways of reaching out to people. We also are very blessed to have tons of organizations that may or may not be interested in this, but at least you can use them to, to gain access to the community. Um, and I'd just like to put a plug in there because I, I love the Citizen Court Council. I've been working with them since 2000, 2005. Um, and there is no better program out there within the emergency community to be able to engage the whole community. Um, it allows for you to have a centralized place where people can relate to government. Um, and if you just have to make sure you're open to, every, to it. Um, you can build partnerships with individuals. You can use resources and leverage other people's resources, which may even be just simply a list of people who you can reach out to and engage in the conversation. Um, and from very early on in our, in our Citizen Corps Council, we were really focused on vulnerable communities. And we did a lot of mapping. We've got a great GIS department. Um, and we, we sort of looked at the vulnerable communities that I think we would really be interested in working with. And we chose youth, special needs, and uh, immigrants, and limited English proficient individuals. Um, so we developed task forces, and we invited people to be part of a task force to develop projects, and, and we saw a lot of gain from that. Um, and we sort of laid a pretty good foundation for us to work with. In the last year, we've done a, a whole lot of stuff with that foundation. And just a few things I'd like to just point out here um, is that we did a special needs symposium where we invited caregivers, we invited consumers to talk in the same room, and we had 130 people come in, and we didn't say, okay, this is what you should do. We asked the questions. So, this is what we're doing. How, do we, how does this engage with you? And what can we do better on? And so we put together a white paper and, and issued it to everyone who came and said, okay, this is what we discussed. And so it's a, it enables you to have that conversation with individuals on a, on a very personal level. We also have a disaster volunteer conference. We really support our volunteers there. Um, and what we did was we really wanted to do is cross-cultural communication. And we said, okay, these are our suggestions on how you can engage your own community. Um, and we followed it up, and we, I also run this, the CERT program, Community Emergency Response Team program for New York City. Um, and with our CERT program, we're really, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult, I think. Someone said it earlier today, is that people are looking for the emergency they want to respond to. So instead of waiting for that, we said, okay, you know, something you can do every single day in your community is reach out and discuss this with them. It's not just teaching personal preparedness, but it's engaging community. And so we developed a program called Community Disaster Networks where we tasked the teams with going out and talking to their community and putting together a list of a network that they can use in any time of emergency. And it's just a fantastic way of getting volunteers out there. And, and John was one of our volunteers and, and probably the most vocal on a national level, but also such a leader within the CERC community to be able to reach out and, 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 and provide guidance to other volunteers who are looking for ways to be able to get back into the community. So that's sort of how we engage our community, but it's all the nexus is the Citizen Court Council and bringing everyone together to have that conversation. One of the things that you said struck me was the fact that you had to be open and yeah. to, to listen to what people had to say. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of something that you were maybe doing or thinking of doing, but then listening and open to what people said, you said we were at, you realize you're going down like 180 degrees the wrong way. 
I, I, I know it happened to, to myself and Boston a couple, but I wonder in New York, I'm, 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 I would suspect it may have happened once or twice, but uh, yeah, where government I, was thinking one thing and uh, everybody yeah. else was thinking something else. Um, we, we, I, I, our volunteers are very active in telling us exactly what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And I, I really do think that you know, having that access is, is incredible. And it's just the, going back to the special needs symposium, you know, we have a lot of resources for, for people to use, but listening to their ways of it's not working or it is working or you need to provide us more guidance with that. And I don't have a specific example, but out of that came a lot of good discussion that can be used and brought back to our planning division where we say, okay, you know, this is what we think is going on and really this is what they see it being. So, I mean, that open conversation really is so important to have in government and being also being open to receive criticism because I don't know if everyone is ready for that, but you know, it's the, it's the best way you to learn, for you to learn and if something's not working, the last time you want to find that out is during an emergency. Very well said, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Carolyn, uh, you've also reached out to engage diverse communities in, in the Denver metropolitan area. Uh, what insight have you gained from, from that? Well, one of the insights that I've gained through this whole process of the last five years is to developing the relationships in order to engage the community. Rachel Coles is um, one of the people that I really have to thank because she came to me, she says, Carolyn, this is what I want to do. And I said, what do you need me to do? And off we went. Um, she is very great at getting into the communities and being part of those communities. I had the tools and the, and the trainers to come in and teach the program for her. So we were working on the CERT programs in order the, for our divor diverse populations to actually own their own CERT teams. They don't belong to Denver, they belong to the communities in which those communities serve their own communities. So by doing that, we have taken some of what has been classified in the past as our vulnerable communities and turned them into very powerful, very strong communities in order to take care of themselves and work together. Um, we had our own um, disaster drill. We had it in several different places. We had the emergency management or emergency operations center open that they called to. And we had the Korean church and we had the mosque and we had um, just so many different partners that have come to the table to work with us, actually do the drill. One of them did the drill and did the ex full size exercise at the same time because St. Cajetan's Catholic Church has developed their own CERT team of 60 people. And they put their own people to work during fairs and pilgrimages and, and things like that. So we also work with the LDS Church that they are coming to the table and we are working strong with them. All of the, the honorable mentions from Colorado, which was five honorable mentions for this particular program, we all know each other. We all work together. We all enjoy being together and running things together um, and developing those relationships that we need. Um, one of the things that we do in Denver is, is give the power back to the people because we know that we're not gonna be able to do it all. They're gonna be there to help their neighbors and having the neighborhoods helping the neighborhoods, the churches helping the neighborhoods, the, um, all of the groups just coming together to take care of their own group, it makes our life so much easier. And you know, because we have, in Denver, we have five people who work for the Office of Emergency Management, and we have a million people to serve in and out of our city. That's 200,000 per one individual in emergency management. And these offices that are my coworker, co um, people up here, there's no difference. They have the same amount of, of, of balance that I have. So we need the volunteers. We need people to take care of their communities. We need the volunteers who you're gonna hear from one of them um, in shortly, but we have that capability of building strong community. And it comes down to the point that we are only as strong as our community in Denver is. So if we have the people behind us, we're gonna do great. It, what has struck me with you and everybody so far is the passion 
that you have for this. And this is not an eight-hour day job. No. Um, <laughs> no. Really? Um, but we, where do you get that passion from? Um, my, my first event was Hurricane Andrew in, in 1992. And then I went back into private industry and fell and bumped my head on a motorcycle in 2004 and got up and about a couple weeks later I looked at my husband and I said, I have to do something with a purpose. I have to do something with a mission. I have to give back to our community. He said, quit your job. I said, oh, God, you got to be <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. So I was blessed with the opportunity to take four months, evaluate where I needed to go, where God needed to point me. And with that, I actually have a job um, with the government that pays me to do my mission in life to help take care of God's children, no matter how they worship. How, how grateful can you be for that? Um, and it just, it never stops. So that's where I get my passion from. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. It's not like a job sometimes. It's not a job. Some days maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> engaging the youth in emergencies is, and preparedness really have benefits that go much beyond just that one <coughs> child, whether it's getting the, the families involved and everyone else involved. and you know, getting their friends and how did the Red Cross in, in Chicago really engage the youth? Um, I think we're flexible. We, we go to where the kids are, whether that's school or a church group or an after school program. Um, we, we try to teach, you know, at least one class every day, you know, so it's not the 192 days that Chicago public schools are in school, but it's 365 days a year. We find kids somewhere. We're going to roll out our suite of programs. So we have 11 different offerings and we can typically find something that works for, for a kid, whether they're pre-kindergarten all the way through high school. Um, so I think it, it's important for us to be flexible and we couldn't do it without the support of the partners we have. Um, the state of Illinois and the emergency management folks support our programs um, and we couldn't do it without our AmeriCorps members. You know, our AmeriCorps members are our boots on the ground in addition to our volunteers and they're you know, teaching thousands of youth each month in you know, water safety or fire safety or, or being home alone. You know, we have programs, we have needs in our community, um, and we work to identify those on a regular basis. And you, you mentioned uh, AmeriCorps and you know, Chicago, <laughs> like any major urban area, and unfortunately throughout the country there's low income areas and people that have you know, not a lot, and we talk preparedness, and people sometimes think preparedness costs a lot of money. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't. How do you how did you deal with that? In the, the low income areas and using the miracle. Um, I, it, it, it's interesting. We had a conversation last week about, you know, the lower income families think that being prepared costs more. So we really try to to work to identify places that need our services, whether it's providing smoke alarms and car carbon monoxide detectors, or providing a kit, or just sitting down in someone's home and saying, "This is what you need to do to prevent a fire in your house." Um, and we're constantly looking to serve new communities. Um, we, we serve 13 counties in northeastern Illinois and northwestern Indiana, and we're constantly looking for different ways to make our programs flexible to their needs. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we encourage people a lot of times just to be prepared at home in, in transit, uh, but also in the workplace. Uh, Mike, how did you, what prompted NBC Universal to to implement the CERT program? I think uh, my business has been uh, pretty proactive in the disaster preparedness arena for uh, decades. NBC Universal has, has had uh, some kind of program in place. And, um, you know, we, we had a core group of people that wanted to help on a daily basis in a disaster, whatever it was. So CERT finally came along, and it made a lot of sense to implement that program in our business. Um, we actually implemented it in 1991 prior to the FEMA release of the national standard. We went off uh, the LA City's model. And uh, it's, it's turned out to be a great program for our business. It allows us to be prepared overall as a business. Um, it makes us self-sufficient in a disaster. Um, our employees then can take that knowledge and go home. They're prepared at home. Uh, and we also encourage them to join uh, their community groups, you know, get the word out, be prepared at home. Join your local CERT teams. Uh, 
And today we have over 250 active CERT member volunteers on the studio lot in uh, Universal City. So it's been a great program for our business. That's great. Uh, what are some of the successes that you had with it, our examples of um, the, the, the CERT teams? We have an incredible amount of talent on our lot, being a movie studio, obviously. You mean another kind of talent? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, you should come see our disaster drill. It's like a movie set. It's really fun. <laughs> uh, um, but we have, a, like I was saying, a, a very great senior leadership that gives us the uh, ability to put on these programs. And, and I think it starts with our people. We have a very, very dedicated group of volunteers. And together, we're, we've uh, put together various programs that have enhanced the CERT program, such as a pediatric model for the uh, CERT curriculum. We've uh, developed what's called a rapid intervention uh, team. The fire service has been using it. We have a CERT modeled one now. We've also done uh, uh, various other modules with the basic CERT training, which has been really, really uh, enhanced our programs, including commercial search and rescue, high-rise search and rescue, um, and a lot of different things. And, and next year I'm excited because we have a, a group working on, on various other new and exciting things that we're, we obviously share with our communities as well. Thanks. Abby, uh, your husband provided not just New York but the nation with really an invaluable resource um, in case of emergency. And the blog and what he did and, and, and how he did it in his the outstanding work and dedication that he had uh, really set an example for lots of folks on, on how to, on what to do and how to do it. And for anybody that really wants to make a difference as, as he did, um, how, how would you suggest somebody that wants to carry on that legacy? Or? Okay, so I'm going to read because <laughs> obviously this was his work and I'll be more comfortable and also, but anyway. Um, but I wanted to start by thanking um, everyone for this honor um, on behalf of my daughters, Sarah and Rebecca, and our family, um, and for all the work all of you do every day to keep us safe. Um, as I said, it's difficult for me to know exactly what John would suggest, but I can tell you most definitely what he would have loved, which is to be here with all of you. Um, he would have been so exhilarated to, to hear the exchange of ideas that has gone over, on over the last two days as part of the FEMA and the Champions of Change event. This is exactly what John felt needed to happen, communication. John's blog was about connecting people in all parts of preparedness, sharing ideas, and encouraging them. He realized that in order to be a truly prepared nation, all levels of government, businesses, media, as well as citizens needed to communicate and work together. Uh, I thought I'd tell you a little about John's journey, and maybe that would be helpful. In September of 2001, John was working as a journalist, and we were living in New York City when 9-11 happened. We had a one-year-old daughter, and soon another on the way. And I began feeling unsafe and telling John I felt unsafe and nagging him or whatever. The wife does sometimes. Um, anyway, in an effort to protect our family, he did what he so often did. He began researching. And he realized it was a topic that fascinated him and one where he might be able to make a real difference. So he started out writing a book on citizens' preparedness and soon realized how complicated the subject was and how pressing the need was and is for solutions. The blog was intended to be research for the book, but what John soon understood is that preparedness is a field of constant change, and the blog suited this. He could report, interview, and showcase these changes instantly and always with a sense of humor. He read, interviewed, attended, and corresponded with everyone and anyone in the preparedness and resiliency fields. He began volunteering for our local community emergency response team, where he could gain practical experience while aiding his fellow New Yorkers. John's blog, In Case of Emergency, read blog, began as a desire to prepare his family and grew into a passion to prepare every family in America. Six months into his blogging, John was faced with his own emergency when diagnosed with leukemia. For the next two years, he continued to work with such determination on preparedness and his blog. As soon as the doctor told him he was in remission, he was on a plane to a preparedness conference in Colorado. And his last summer, when he was suffering severely from complications from a bone marrow transplant, he took the train to the Red Cross Emergency Social Data Summit here in Washington 
and I will tell you, it was a highlight for John in his life. The exchange of ideas, the working together to move forward and create a safer nation was what mattered so much to him as the John D. Solomon Preparedness Award matters so much to our family. I thank you again for this award, for helping to keep John's work and memory alive, and for the work you all do on behalf of our nation. And I, I just want to take really a minute to say something mainly to your daughters, that your dad really made a difference in hundreds and thousands of people's lives and helped save lives across this country from the work that he did. He's truly a hero. Oh, still got time, that's great. Okay. <laughs> now, I won't pick on New York yet, I'll pick on... You know. I just want to, you know, FEMA is grappling with a lot of the same issues as a lot of you have, have dealt with, and we've talked about whole community for the last, you know, year or so. And, and coming from a city, a whole community for us was something that we had really been doing for a while, never called it whole community. It, it wasn't, you know, a shock that you had to bring together the, you know, faith-based community, you had to bring together the private sector. It may have been a shock to some people in, in this town. Um, but as, as we do that and we, we look to bring together all different aspects, some of the things that, that, that struck me out of, you know, I was just writing down different phrases and words that people said, that, that struck me was that people needed to have, be open, they need to be flexible, they need to listen. People in emergency management seem to have that passion and it's centered around people. What advice would you give us at FEMA and people who work in this building on what we can do to help further the cause of emergency management and preparedness. And I'll throw that open to anyone. I would say uh, to continue to offer uh, support for preparedness programs, but also reach across to different uh, areas of emergency management, mitigation, preparedness response, uh, all those things tie in together. And we want to continue to have balanced programs, and we really need uh, support from the from the top to make that happen. And, and Rich, what I'll say is um, one of the important pieces of, of all the work that we do is sort of continuity. Things that uh, our predecessors have worked on, things that will happen after we leave, we sort of build on all of these programs. And when we make minute changes or when we change funding or when we change focus, sometimes the work that's been happening for 10 or 15 years gets lost. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that we do is, is build that preparedness model for citizens, for volunteers to say, no matter what happens, these are the activities that you need to do. And this work has to continue, uh, you know, without the folks at this table and sitting in the audience, uh, people lose that message and they don't get it. So if we can continue to, to have these type programs going forward, I think that's probably what's best helpful. One of the programs uh, approximately two years ago um, that came to Denver and was throughout the whole, that visited several large cities across the United States was um, informing the faith-based organizations of their abilities and capabilities and what we need to um, utilize them. That program went on one time and I would love to see that FEMA or FEMA regions um, develop that program, bring it back out to our communities, and give us the opportunity to help you market that program, get the, get the word out on the streets, because that's where we live, is on the streets, and get that information out there so we can start showing the small church who has a pantry that that pantry, we want them to do the same thing during a disaster. We just want them to do it a little bigger. 
and not ask them to step out of their comfort zones. And that way we'll have the opportunity to build more resilient communities. Um, we have a food bank of the Rockies. It's an amazing organization. They have approximately a thousand different pantries in the metro area. Those thousand pantries can be our distribution points for food distribu distributing and water distributing, and we don't have to invent a new distribution point. And that's only one thing, but if FEMA can bring those types of, of seminars or um, summits or whatever you want to call them, um, you don't even have to feed them. You just bring, <laughs> bring the experts and let, let them identify what they can do to help us build our community to be more resilient, then we'll need less national resources at the time of a big event. We, we can start utilizing our hometown folks and building our own cities back up to where they need to be, which is what I believe the Stafford Act has in mind. Anyhow. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I think that you, you hit it on the head. I think we have to look at what is in the communities on a day-to-day -day basis. And you mentioned food pantries, and I think, in, unfortunately, in probably almost every church, faith-based synagogue, mosque, whatever, there is some sort of food pantry in every town across this country. I wish there wasn't, because yes. that tells us that you know people are in severe need. But the fact that they're there, and how to just get people's head wrapped around in the faith-based community that they have a role something similar that years ago we had issues with the community health centers in Boston and, and did some things in New York as well with community health centers. They say, we have no role in disaster. We don't do brain surgery. And it's like, well, we don't want you to do brain surgery. We want, we want you to do what's in your community each and every day to take care of people who speak the language, who you understand the community. And that's what the faith-based community does as well and to, to take that to the next level. So I hear that the faith-based community, um, I hear that we, you know, working with the youth, continuing the preparedness, and, and reaching out and working with the businesses. I, I think I'm hearing that. Go ahead. And I just want to add that the importance of supporting research uh, into uh, natural hazards, other hazards. Uh, you know, the shakeout started with a big effort led by Dr. Lucy Jones at the USGS to develop a scenario for what might happen on the San Andreas Fault. And, and that was so enormous and it, and it showed all the businesses and the fire services and everybody what might happen. And we all looked at how do we involve so many people, but also that we wouldn't be able to do it uh, all ourselves. So that's where we really looked, looked at how do we involve the whole community. And you know, across California now, we have these you know, three groups across the state in SoCal Bay Area and North Coast because it has to get down to the grassroots level uh, and still involve all those people. But the balance that we found between research and effectively grassroots activism is really key, where you can take that research and, and get it down to people who really are making the decisions on a daily basis. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, I was just gonna, I mean, I was just gonna say is that I think that um, integrating into everyone's lives, daily lives, just finding ways of not making, sh make, making sure it's not something that they feel like they have to like do separate you know, and that works for businesses, that works for schools, that works for, for individuals. Just finding a way to say, you know, there's a lot of different ways people get messages. How do we get the emergency management, emergency preparedness message into all those different resources? So it's not something that's separate. It's something that's integrated with everyone else. And also, I think someone mentioned it as well, like youth. I think that's, that's a great way of getting in there. And I think that we're on the right track with that, of engaging the youth and finding more resources for that. Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. This has been helpful for me. I hope helpful to the people in the room and the people that are on the web as well. So there's going to be another group coming. So can I make an executive decision and tell everybody if they want to take their name tags as Sylvania? Please do. <laughs> thank you. We're just going to get repositioned here for just a second. Thank
All right, I think that first panel was a great discussion. I think that uh, I'll deserve another round of applause for that first panel. Um, and thank you to Richard for moderating the panel and for your passion and leadership uh, on this topic. Uh, but we have another special guest who will be moderating the second panel. Uh, we're honored to be joined uh, by Richard Reed, who is Special Assistant to the President and Homeland Security Director for Resilience Policy with the National Security Staff. So I'll let him take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Uh, Rich, uh, you set the bar. I will try not to disappoint. Uh, and then the last piece is apparently without Rich or Richard as a first name, you can't be a moderator. So <laughs> <laughs> you can change your names if you like. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You folks are actually representing exactly what we are trying to do on behalf of the President uh, and certainly Secretary Napolitano and others across the federal family, and that is to build and sustain a more resilient nation. Um, from, from where I sit here, uh, I spend every day thinking about preparedness activities uh, and response activities. Uh, I have a directorate that deals with everything on the left of boom, so before bad things happen, and then we deal with everything on the right of boom. So uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with our colleagues in the interagency community and certainly across the country uh, trying to understand better uh, what is it that you are doing in your communities, how are you building and sustaining resilience, how are you doing that in partnership with others. And I so, I, so I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to dialogue with you here, to learn from you here, uh, and to think about how we can collectively, as the President has said in his preparedness poly, policy, it is an all of nation approach. It's uh, everybody has a role, everybody has a responsibility, everybody can contribute uh, to building and sustaining a better, uh, stronger, and more resilient nation. So what I'd like to do is take a second quickly to introduce uh, uh, the distinguished panel members here. Uh, provide a little bit of background in uh, terms of who's who in the zoo, as I like to say, mm -hmm. uh, and then spend a little bit of time with some questions and answers. So uh, Michael Smith uh, is here with us. Uh, you can pick him out of the crowd with the uh, uniform, uh, the chief of the fire department of San Miguel uh, Reservation, which lies at the intersection uh, of several fault lines along the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains. He operates the San Miguel uh, CERT and the Tribal Emergency Response Team. So uh, thank you, sir, for being here, and we very much look forward to, to chatting with you. Uh, Greg Schrader uh, is Executive Director of the nonprofit uh, Be Ready Alliance, uh, coordinating for emergencies, BRACE, uh, in the state of Florida. And uh, certainly that's a state that uh, needs to be ready all the time for yes. all kinds of uh, weather-related and non-weather-related emergencies. Uh, Wendy Freitag. Uh, is here with us, and uh, she's the external affairs manager of the Washington State Military Department, uh, responsible for public outreach uh, and engagement. Thank you for being here. Todd Pritchard is with us as well as the emergency coordinator uh, for the Wisconsin Emergency Management and directs the statewide Ready Wisconsin Preparedness Campaign. Uh, so thank you for coming as well, and sorry about those Packers. We're, we're still in mourning, yes, thank you. <laughs> Nobody's safe up here. <laughs> uh, Brenda Gormley is with us today, and we're thrilled from Denton, Texas. I've been there many times uh, as the Texas Community Emergency Management Response Team program, and so definitely look forward to hearing from that. Uh, Julia Simpson is with us as well, a Homeland Security Planner for St. Clair County Homeland Security and Emergency Management and coordinates the county's Citizen Corps program. Uh, Darlene Foote, uh, the Director of Communications for Cobb and Douglas County Public Health and creator of the Public Health Safety Village Project. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Look forward to hearing about that. David Mack is coordinator for the Racine County Office of Emergency Manager and, uh, Management and routinely works with the faith-based community uh, to ensure that we have capabilities across that entire sector. Uh, and Venus Majeski. At the, down on the end, uh, Director of Development and Community Relations for the New Jersey Institute for Disabilities and leads the Alonza Emergency Preparedness Project Plus. Uh, and so we will spend a little bit of time, uh, but certainly if you don't mind in joining me uh, again, thanking and congratulating our champions. So, Michael, if we could, sir, I'd like to start with you and just get a sense of how the use of technology and innovative resource management is being applied uh, to increase response capabilities during disasters, of which you've had some pretty significant uh, events this year. Absolutely. Well, this past year. Yeah, yeah. Samuel well lies in the disaster central, basically, right? the, 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 con the confluence of several faults, a major floodplain and wildfires, which we can talk about, too, is certainly a, 
in California, it's a relatively small jurisdiction, but ten, uh, in the 10 years I've been there, we've had three presidentially declared disasters, so, so we're no, we're no uh, stranger to that. But yeah, our strategy for, for developing preparedness ca capability and capacity is to identify a couple of initiatives each year so that we're sort of in a continuous quality improvement model that each year we push the bar a little higher. And tw 2011 was really a technology year for us, so we took a couple, or our, uh, a couple of initiatives uh, that were tech-based, and one was uh, a, a, a computer program that allows us to notify tribal citizens and employees. It's called Send Word Now. And that, uh, people can go on a register. We have about 60% saturation of our community right now, which is pretty good. And uh, they can pick how they want to be notified on, by voice, cell phone, home phone, text message, email. And it gives us a direct conduit into their homes, into their computers, to provide warning messages, to provide training reminders, to provide evacuation messages, uh, anything that was, that's germane to the emergency management function. So to supplement that, we, we built a, a Wi-Fi grid over the entire jurisdiction. So there's Wi-Fi computer access over the whole Sam Well Reservation. And hand in hand with that, we have something called Net Notify, which allows us emergency managers to create a pop-up on anybody who's logged on to a Sam Well computer or, or getting their internet provider through our Wi-Fi system to pop up a message. So you'd be surprised how many people we can just send a pop-up to say, there's a, a traffic collision at, at such such intersection, please route your, your vehicle traffic accordingly. How many people see that pop-up, both employees, we have 3,500 employees, and, uh, and tribal citizens as well. So those were two big, uh, two big initiatives. The other, other great thing about the Wi-Fi grid is that it allowed uh, uh, responders to have a robust backbone for interoperable communication. So an incident commander in the field can not only reach out and touch citizens and employees where they are at that moment, but they can access technical resources, internet resources, and other responders on a very variety of uh, technological platforms to mitigate an incident. And, and, and was this a partnership uh, with, uh, with the service providers as well as with the responders? Absolutely. It, I would say the, the biggest partnership was our internal stakeholders. We have an IT department, our public works department, and, and if, the greatest dividend of my tenure has been developing a group of stakeholders that is committed to emergency management. And this, these, these specific initiatives are merely symptomatic of, of that nexus of stakeholders that, are, that have buy-in into preparedness, that have buy-in into mitigation, that are fully committed to us being a resilient and safe community. That, that's a great example. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to hearing the, the next evolution of the two or three new technology innovations for, for the next year. And, Rich, I hope you're taking notes, because we could, we could use that here. <laughs> uh, I want to switch to, to Greg uh, and, and walk us through uh, what is BRACE, uh, how, how has it and how does it maintain strong relationships uh, with the public and the private and the faith base, which are three very different interconnected and interrelated communities of interest, not all together necessarily heading in the same direction at the same time. So interested to know how you, how you crack that nut. BRACE serves as the COAD, or Community Organization Active in Disaster in Escambia County, Florida, but we also serve as the Citizen Corps Coordinator for Escambia County, the City of Pensacola, and the Town of Century, and every partner involved with our organization is also a Citizen Corps member. We also serve as the CERT coordinator in each of those three communities and find that uh, engaging the entire community, the faith-based community, the business community, the public sector, uh, the private sector are critical components to advance readiness advance resilience in our community. We have partners like Rebuild Northwest Florida that's mitigated or hardened over 5,000 homes in our community. We've got partners like the Early Learning Coalition that's worked with the Red Cross and faith-based community and other partners to establish a child care for first responders initiative. We found after Hurricane Ivan that first responders couldn't respond to their duty stations because they were faced with the impossible choice of choosing between the care of their children and responding to their duty stations. We've now established a child care facility that's in a safe structure with many, many partners that ensure those individuals that are on the front lines and protecting our community can do so with peace of mind knowing that their children are going to be well taken care of. 
We serve as the Emergency Support Function 15 lead or vol for volunteers and donations in our community and have had the opportunity to deploy individuals to oil spills and other events over our history. We have um, 61 faith-based partners in our community that have agreed to serve in one or more of 12 different roles the day after, the week after, and the month after a disaster. So as you can see, it takes the entire community to be ready and resilient for the next event. I, I, I greatly appreciate that. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll share with the group, and, and Rich uh, was definitely part of making this happen when we Every year we provide the, the president a, a hurricane briefing uh, um, led by the scientists from NOAA that, that provide the predictions on what they think the hurricane season is going to bring. And, and we have done this for presidents across uh, the history of the, of the office. Um, and normally it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a great um, uh, event in the sense that everybody gets excited about it. It's a, it's a pretty, uh, at some level, depressing kind of thought about hurricane season coming. But the good news is you have an opportunity to de demonstrate to the president how we're prepared for it. So over the years, we've done it in a variety of ways. Uh, I think the first briefing we did for the president uh, was with his cabinet officials to say, here's how... Department X, Y, and Z is preparing and what they're doing. And the next year, uh, we did it with, uh, certainly with Rich, uh, Craig Fugate, and the FEMA regional administrators, uh, Tim Manning as well, uh, to talk about what FEMA was doing and how they were thinking about it. Um, and every year we finished it, I would get the question from my boss, uh, John Brennan, that said, hey, how'd you think we did? And I said, well, we did pretty good. And he goes, well, that's great. Let's do better next year. <laughs> this is how I know I need to leave my job this year, because next year I don't think we can do better. <laughs> um, but this year we did a briefing for the president where it involved more non-federal partners at the table than there were federal partners. Secretary Napolitano, uh, Administrator Fugate, that was about the extent of the federal uh, presentation at the hurricane briefing. Beyond that, it was uh, uh, the governor from North Carolina, uh, the gentleman who runs the Southern Baptist Convention, Gil McGovern from the Red Cross, uh, the vice president of Verizon, um, and lots of other sort of non-federal entities to say, here's how we support national preparedness. Here's how we are prepared to, to support response to hurricanes because it is, there is an inherent federal responsibility, but there's also a shared responsibility across the communities in which we all live. And so I thought that was almost uh, what I heard you say here was that you have really leveraged the capabilities across uh, to, create, to create something bigger than the sum of its parts. We certainly have uh, found that that has been true. Um, I, I spoke earlier about responding to an oil spill. Within 30 hours of activation for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, because we have partnerships with 450 organizations, we were able to mobilize over 950 volunteers, register them, orient them, uh, equip them, and deploy them to cover 32 linear miles of beach to be able to do a pre-impact cleanup to mitigate the impact on our beaches once the oil actually reached our shores. And um, we've been involving young people in our efforts, and certainly young people were involved in that e effort. And I applaud FEMA's uh, forward thinking in the areas of youth preparedness. Great, thank you. And, and again, uh, the, the feeling and the belief in this administration is that um, the answers and, and some of the best solutions to some pretty common problems, uh, as I think I said earlier, don't necessarily lie in the federal uh, community. They actually lie uh, out in the state and local communities. And so I wanted to turn to Wendy um, and just get a sense if you can tell us how that work uh, prepares neighborhoods to be resilient, uh, resilient for disasters and emergencies. Uh, and, and sort of this Map Your Neighborhood program that you all developed. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is a great honor to be here, and, um, and really uh, it's an honor to accept this award on behalf of my talented external affairs team that are back today putting into practice in Washington State um, the, the Map Your Neighborhood program, we believe. Uh, and the, no yes, and there's no shoes uh, from door to door. We've had an unusually... Um, winter storm uh, that's hit our state. And um, we believe that today um, neighbors are out helping neighbors, um, which is what is the cornerstone of our program known as Map Your Neighborhood. Um, it was, I think, brilliantly conceived by a woman by the name of Dr. Luann Johnson, um, who experienced disaster firsthand 
by going through the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And she recognized from that experience that, um, that there was a period of time, she refers to it as the golden 60 minutes following a large scale event that emergency responders, despite their best efforts, cannot reach everyone and cannot reach certain neighborhoods. And so um, the program really was built with the concept of allowing people to help each other. So it's, um, you know, the neighbor to neighbor helping concept. Um, and it teaches them and gives them a, che a checklist of things that they can do to be uh, most effective on checking on each other, uh, establishing a neighborhood care center, um, knowing what skill sets exist in that neighborhood. A neighborhood uh, is, consists of pr approximately 15 to 20 homes, um, but it gives everyone a role, and I, I think that's what makes the program um, very appealing. Um, it's now in 38 states. Um, it's in three countries, and I think it gets back to the most human basic need, which is to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, and to really give people a role, I think that, you know, uh, we are a great resilient nation and we've survived many things in our history. And so I think that that's built into our DNA, but I think that that's the great thing that we need to do in our preparedness programs is figure out ways to plug in everybody that wants to have a role because we know that we need everyone to help us after a disaster, particularly a large scale disaster. So. Um, I think that's the, the success of the program. I think it also is built to um, be aware of people's um, time. And we have a very, people are very busy in their lives, and so it takes 90 minutes. It takes one person stepping forward to be, to fill a leadership role, to be a facilitator, and bring um, their neighbors together, um, and to go through this training and to give them some sort of order and checklist that allows them to be able to serve um, and, and have a role following disasters. Uh, I, I think that's wonderful. I think we, we've often had this debate about uh, the way we think about this nation of first responders. Um, and we have seen from you know, events here domestically all across the country, uh, from events in places like Haiti uh, and certainly in Japan, that really the first responder is the family member, the neighbor, mm -hmm. the, the church member, the person you saw at the grocery store that is, is, that is there to help lend a hand if indeed they have the, the sense of what to do, right? Yeah, uh, and absolutely. I think it's the training programs that you offer uh, in that respect that at least provide people enough information to do something uh, and to be part of the solution. So I, uh, I applaud your efforts for that. Yeah. I think that's absolutely great. Um, I wanted to, to uh, extending sort of this notion on the ready.gov uh, side of the house as a, as a nationwide awareness campaign and, and tool uh, really designed to help educate and, and empower uh, folks, uh, Americans, and certainly can be used in, in other society as well, uh, to prepare for emergencies. Um, and and there is, there is a, there's a nuanced difference between ready and resilient. Uh, ready are the things that you know you need to do. Resilient is the ability to do those things. And, and so uh, I, I would challenge uh, us to think about ready in, in terms of a state uh, and resilient in terms of a, an evolution of that state. So uh, that's my foot stomper for today. But uh, Todd, you've done a, a lot of great work uh, in Wisconsin, uh, recent, recent efforts to prepare, and certainly um, have the, the, some of the roughest winters in the country every year. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm so honored to be here. You're, you're right. I think the, the Ready Wisconsin campaign is really an extension of uh, FEMA's Ready campaign. We really localize it to our state. And, uh, and we use it as a platform to not only get people to our website, uh, which if you're out there is readywisconsin.wi.gov, uh, but it's also to, um, to use that and also uh, social media um, and um, more conventional media to get the word out to really to get this ingrained into our culture that we need to be prepared so we get out messages on a daily basis telling people what's coming what's going on and then we use our media partners um, we've had great success of putting together some really awesome media campaigns we had um, Matt Kenseth the NASCAR driver uh, Wisconsin native, and we asked him, would you do a campaign for us on getting an emergency w winter kit in your car? 
And he said, absolutely. Um, and so we shot this spot. It was very low budget, but it got the message across. And we gave out kits on our website. Um, we encourage people to just put a simple little kit together in their cards. So, so it's one of those things, just do one thing that's not going to be a whole lot of money, and, and it, it got such a great response. And then I think the other thing Herman hit on in the first panel is it's all about the kids and getting to those students out there and because it's the kids who are going to change their society. We're not going to do it, right? So, uh, and, and they're going to pester us to do it. So. Um, I want to just thank FEMA so much for the STEP program. We were able to do it as a, a pilot project uh, in Wisconsin last year. We had 2,400 students sign up. Um, uh, we have 5,500 students for this year. Um, just amazing. Every corner of the state. It's a, if you don't know what that is, it's a student tools for emergency planning. It's a very turnkey. You send them a box. It's got all the printed material. The teachers don't need to do anything. It doesn't cost them a dime. And you can teach from one hour up to even eight hours of material. And those kids, it's amazing. We went to some of the step schools and the kids' eyes just light up. They each get a, a, an emergency kit, like a starter kit. And they can take that home and tell their mom and dad, this is what the kid is. Look at what I got. How are we going to get our family ready, mom and dad? And that's kind of the start of that huge conversation that we need to be doing across the country. So I, I think it's just been an outstanding program. I really hope we can spread it all across the nation. It's outstanding. Thank you very much. And, and sort of dovetailing off of that uh, uh, to Brenda, but as, as a volunteer uh, sort of in this effort, stepped up to help not only identify and establish, but to train uh, volunteers and teams uh, in the community. And so the question to you is, uh, what do you tell others uh, who want to establish and sustain it. We, we have lots of volunteer programs that have started off and fizzled out. Uh, we have some that have kind of got through the theoretical part about starting out but never actually got anywhere. Uh, so what was the magic uh, that you were able to find to, to not only start it, uh, to sustain it? Thank you. I think the biggest magic was, was have the passion in your heart. Believe in what the program is. Have the education behind it. Take all the classes. There's a million classes online from FEMA and to know what you're talking about. And I've been very fortunate in Denton County that I had the support from not only our, our um, FEMA Region 6, but also our judge and our emergency manager, Joseph Gonzalez, who's here in the audience with me. But they let us be a part of the family. We're not just a volunteer. We're there to help them before a disaster, during the disaster, and after the disaster. And one thing I really love about it is that they treat all of my volunteers, and I have over 500 of them, as part of the family. If they come into the building, they're welcome. There's no questions. They give us the trust to do what we can do with the training that they help provide for us. And without that training, it helps our citizens you know, to know what to do. My grandmother had a saying that we grew up on, if you can't take care of yourself, how do you expect somebody else to take care of you? And that's the way we were raised, and it's in my heart. The CERT program came along. I was a VIPS volunteer. Um, the CERT program came along, and I studied it and went to class and thought, man, this is back to neighbor helping neighbor, taking care of each other, taking care of our family. And that was my passion. And so. Several years later, um, I'm very fortunate in our, in our North Central Texas Council of Governments, we have a regional citizen core council, and we have gotten all of the citizen core groups together. We've gotten rid of, of boundary lines. We've trained together. We're able to go to each other's training, each other's drills. Um, we help each other not only in time of no disasters, but during a disaster. Or if I need help, I can pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, send me some more bodies. And they're there for each other. It's amazing. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it speaks volumes uh, to, to not only the leadership, but also to the, the sense of cohesion in the community to, to sustain that activity. Because I, I believe that, that the, you as, as sort of uh, the drumbeat uh, leading the effort is, is part of it. But the other part of it is folks buying in, uh, owning uh, their responsibility in that and sustaining it. I think that's outstanding. And, and so for that, I wanted to swing over to Jody uh, and sort of talk about 
how the Citizen Corps Council, uh, particularly in St. Clair County, uh, engaged the public in, in what can only be described as a fun and innovative way, which is, by the way, not easy to do. So can you tell us <laughs> no, about not, that? Not very much at all. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say I'm very blessed to be here representing St. Clair County Emergency Management. We have a great group of people with you know, very diverse backgrounds, and I think that that's the key to get started anywhere because the networking that come out that can come out of that is just really, really priceless. And uh, the, the Citizen Corps Council is noticing that there still today is a really big disconnect between what citizens expect following a disaster and what we're able to provide. And I think with the uh, government, you know, it's hey, we're going to push this harder at them, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that when when really it's all about serving them, and we should be uh, doing what they recommend and getting them involved. So we try to brainstorm new ways to bring the public up and uh, start dialect and conversations with them, and we did that with social media, um, Facebook being, I'd say, primarily the, the strongest one for us. And uh, it was really, it just seems like a great way, not only like a redundant alert and warning system, but also it's a great platform for the community to be able to speak with us and uh, give us suggestions. And even if they have disaster pics, pictures that they'd like to throw up, that's a great opportunity to do that. So we wanted to get started with that, and we did. And then um, following that, we had our first video and ad contest. And like you said, um, you know, like, with government, it, it seems like we're always trying to recreate the same message in a new way, and we're really boring at it. <laughs> so um, we thought, hey, well, we, we need to change this up. So we actually invited the, the community to get involved, and we had a lot of um, kids get involved and make videos, 60-second um, PSAs, and then print materials. And what they were able to come up with is just phenomenal. It's a great way to get the message across in new, fresh, exciting ways, and uh, so much better than we could do it. <laughs> and their, their work really can, can hold your attention, but at the same time, they're getting themselves educated in whatever topic they're, they're working on, as well as their friends, family. And then we put them on uh, YouTube and Facebook and try to get them a lot of recognition. In fact, I um, got, got uh, the video contest winners an interview on a lake, local cable TV show. They were really thrilled about that and then each of them their video was going to play before local movie theater um, as a 60 second video before every single movie for a month. And our youngest winner, who was 13, he found that out and his jaw just dropped and he said, I can't believe the publicity I'm getting. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really exciting. That's the way it should be. You know, it should work for everybody. And I think the bottom line is, hey, we're here to serve our communities and our, our, our local people and our residents. And so why not listen to them and try to follow their lead? I, I got to ask you the question. You, you sort of hear that laundry list of things and immediately to what comes to mind is, how do you afford to do that? And yet you were able to do it at a at a very low cost. And yeah, so that, that was one of the best parts about it. Um, we actually had donated uh, Best Buy gift certificates, and who doesn't want one of those, right? So um, really good price for the kids. And I know that we've, um, we've done video PSAs before, and they can cost you know over $1,000 to have somebody produce one for you, where we got all these submissions that didn't cost us anything. Um, we got to recognize the, the people that did win prizes. And then also we have these these to use throughout the year for different months, different themes, and also can share it with other communities, other regions, even at the state level. So, I mean, it's an open open source for everybody to use, and it really just costs what, what people donated for prizes. So it was great all the way around. That's impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Darlene, I, I kind of wanted to turn to you and, and uh, sort of get the southern perspective, as that's, that's where I come from, and I'm interested in how you were able to sort of develop the hands-on approach to educate, educating not only the youth but also the, the broader public uh, in that area of the country in terms of health preparedness. Uh, and then specifically, how, how was the county able to demonstrate the utility of that in terms of incre increased uh, health efficiencies? Okay. Well, um, I, I'd also like to say that, that it is an honor to be here on behalf of uh, Cobb and Douglas Public Health. And um, the, the way that, that we've done this is um, by meeting our, our young people where they are. And, and, and we've done this uh, by utilizing a uh, interactive, uh, state-of-the-art uh, system that engages our young people. And um, 
uh, to teach them about emergency preparedness and public health issues. And, and uh, just a, a few examples of some of the things that, that we have is, a, a, is there are five modules and they're housed in a public health building and, and that's a part of a, a safety village, which is a, is a mini replica of the city. And, and basically some, what, what we teach them is um, things like hand washing. And, and we don't use the, the, the typical happy birthday song, but we use a, a wrap. And, and, and so, so they wrap and they wash their hands and, and the walls move and soap comes down as, as they wash their hands and the floors move. So that's one. The other thing we do is we talk about um, our germs and, and they get to, to, to smack and stomp any anthrax on the floors and walls. And who doesn't <laughs> love that? And, and then, then we, we, we go a step further and we, we teach them the things that need to go in the, in, in the emergency kit. And so they're pulling on the wall things that go into the emergency kit and the kids on the floor are dragging them with their feet. And then there are things, you know, okay, so you have sodas and you have water. So they have to choose which is better. We all might like sodas more, but the water is what we want them to choose. And, and then we, we explain to them that, that this is what you want in your kit. And, and we also have a couple of other um, um, uh, modules. Uh, one is um, the importance of getting vaccines. And we want kids to not be afraid. We want them to understand because, because again, we're trying to come at them at their level. And so we want them to understand that, that this is important, and, and you guys need to understand you're going to be healthier in the long run for this. And the final module is um, gets them moving, and it's uh, the kids bop shuffle, and they get to dance and move, and again, it's, it's all interactive. We're really excited about what's happening with this because, because the kids are excited, and, and, and quite frankly, the adults are too when they go through. And um, it's um, right right now this, this program um, is, is uh, being... Uh, pushed out to, to 20,000 ch children. Actually, I'll say this, 20,000 children will be going through this uh, program. This is, um, and the, the, the Department of Education uh, has, has um, made this part of the required curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you teach a child, you reach the family. When you reach the family, you impact the community. And when you impact the community, you can change the world. And so that's what we believe that we're, we're going to do with this program. So we're excited about it. And, and just a little bit about uh, the cost. The, the nice thing about this is that um, um, it's all our partners. It's, it's all about partnerships. We, we, didn't, we didn't start this. We didn't create this. Uh, Cobb County uh, looked at safety villages and they thought that it was, they were, it was a good way to go to get the kids into uh, one place instead of the, the, the um, fire, fire department going out to different places. So now they bring all the children to them. They already had that established. We just, just took advantage of that. And so now our building is a part of that, so it didn't cost us anything. Uh, an architect uh, donated his time to, and, uh, to do the building for us. Uh, we, we got a grant from the CDC to, to do the inside of it. So it's all about partnerships, um, and, and we just couldn't do anything without the partnerships, and that's what makes the cost less. And, and, and again, the impact, we, we would never be able to reach these children otherwise. Then our message might get to a few, but it probably wouldn't get to most of these people. So, um, you know, we, we, we believe we're changing the world. It's impressive. I, I, I love that story. I, I sort of... We talk here a lot about building capabilities across the nation and, and how do you do that. And I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy by, by virtue of my Southern reference earlier, but uh, in my mind, it's like a box of Legos. You know, these are the capabilities that we have. These are the relationships and the communities that we have are in this box. And if you need to build a dinosaur, you put them together in such a way as you build a dinosaur. If you need a dump truck, you go back to the same set of capabilities and put them together in a different way. Uh, leveraging the Department of Education, leveraging CDC, leveraging community expertise, uh, leveraging and, and targeting uh, kids where they're at, I think is, is smartly using the box of Legos. And so uh, we can all learn from that. Uh, David, I wanted to sort of turn to you in terms of this notion of faith-based uh, engagement. And I will, I will share with all of you, and, and Rich, uh, in, in fact, Tim could also uh, echo this. When the president had his, um, when he conducted and participated in the national level exercise last year, we, we did, as you all may know, a, a, um, uh, an exercise on what would happen if a, we had a, a catastrophic earthquake along the New Madrid seismic zone. Uh, and so at the end of that exercise, after having gone through several days of, 
of uh, activities and interaction with state and locals and, and, and our federal partners. Uh, the president uh, from the Situation Room was on a, a video teleconference with all eight governors and sort of went through the list of, uh, you know, how's it going and this, that, and the other. At the very end, when, when we all thought that was going to be the end of the conference, the president went back to say to each governor, tell me how you've engaged the, the faith-based communities into integrating into your response capabilities. And this is sort of that notion of the first responder is often somebody not in a uniform. Um, and he was very interested in that. And so I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Well, I've been at this for over 20 years, and we've used the whole community concept um, probably for the last 20 years, mostly out of necessity. Uh, most of our offices are small, one, two people offices, and so we need to engage the community. And one of the, the most important resources in a community is the faith-based um, organizations out there, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques. But yet uh, there's challenges to reaching those communities because they're not a homogenous group. Um, there's a lot of independent churches out there. Um, you have little pockets of associations, but it's a lot of times going at it uh, one by one. And, and two things uh, led up to this. One was uh, after something big would happen, whether it was our own community or even uh, Hurricane Katrina, churches would call and they would either ask the question, what do I do if this happens to us, or how can we help? And oftentimes the first thing they wanted to do was collect um, clothes and, and food, and I'd have to explain, wait a minute, stop, you know, that's not necessarily what's needed at this time. The other thing that happened was my own church in 2008, we had a rare January tornado in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin doesn't typically get uh, tornadoes in, in um, January. We get snowstorms, but we had an unseasonably warm day. Two tornadoes sprung up in Kenosha County to the south of mine. Uh, my home church was in Kenosha at the time uh, on the north side there, and the first tornado hit the west side of Kenosha County. The um, second tornado hit in the city of Kenosha, and it hit our church. It was an EF-1, but it was enough to do a million dollars worth of damage. It took 10 months for the church to rebuild um, and there were a lot of challenges. They didn't have a plan. They, they didn't have a recovery plan, but they were able to survive it. And with the lessons learned, they also were able to add some things into the, the rebuilding of the church. So we put on a, a workshop uh, last January and brought the pastor of uh, Prayer House Assembly of God to talk about his experience with the tornado, how it impacted them, some things that other pastors should consider. And we led the churches um, through a workshop that uh, taught them how to develop an emergency response plan for fire, tornado, an intruder, things like that. The second piece was developing a church recovery plan, and we basically took the open for business uh, model out of um, Florida there and, and used that. And then we talked with them about developing a church outreach plan. If something bad happens in our community, how could you assist us? What are your strengths? And um, we, we gave them several examples to start thinking about so that they could then run with that. That's impressive as well. And I think, you know, just in terms of we all look for the force multiplier and the thing that can be added uh, to that thing we're doing to, to sort of add the value. And I think that uh, that's a great example of that. The, the, the other piece, I wanted to swing down to Venus and, and sort of talk a little bit about uh, the problem we've all been struggling with uh, in, a, in a lot of different ways in terms of those members of our communities that, that have access and functional needs beyond um, uh, sort of what one would anticipate for a normal response uh, to any kind of an emergency. And, and while one size does not fit all in, in all of these cases, there are special uh, accommodations that need to be thought about in advance. And so, Venus, you've, you've done a lot on Project Plus. Uh, I think that's demonstrated uh, a, a, a solid uh, way forward and an approach for this, but just wondered if you could walk us through that. Sure, and at, the, um, at our program, Alianza uh, Emergency Preparedness Plus, it's really not about seeing um, or differentiating people uh, as having special needs because it's uh, viewing the community as one community. And as Commis Commissioner Fugate uh, has mentioned and Marcy Roth uh, at the Department of uh, her Office of Integration, it's about baking this in to, to make us one community. 
And um, at my agency, we're, we're, um, I've been for more than two decades, New Jersey Institute for Disabilities. That's what we believe. We are one community. And so we take a very personal approach. Uh, we will um, meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, go into their homes, and really let them direct their plan. What is it that they need uh, to meet an emergency? Because we all know what's best for ourselves and for our family. We can offer some resources and guidance. But it goes beyond that plan. What we do then is encourage our participants to become a part of the community uh, as it relates to preparedness. We've encouraged uh, our families to uh, take CERT courses and, and they've graduated CERT courses to become volunteers in the Red Cross and the Salvation Army uh, across the board uh, so that we see them neither as special or needy but as contributing to the community. And I think that that's really the, uh, the barrier that we're trying to break. And, and I think probably my job will be well done when no one is surprised that, the, that a person with a disability is able to be cert certified. When, when no one is surprised that a person with a disability is contributing back to their community. That's the core of what we do. And uh, we've been very successful. Our, our families are wonderful participants. Um, the, the staff that, that go into the homes are extraordinary in, in the level of care that, that, that we have. Uh, but it's, it's a matter of, of truly understanding um, that those barriers should not exist. It's believing that. It's understanding that people are people first. And the disability is not what gives them their characteristic. Mm -hmm. It's who they are. And that's what we try to do at Alianza. That's wonderful. Well, again, thank you very much. And, and I, I do believe we, we still have more work to do. Uh, not only in that area, but all areas across the table. I'm, I'm confident uh, with you champions and, and others out there and future champions uh, that there is uh, there are more good news to, to befall all of us. Uh, recognizing that we're they're running close up on time and I'm starting to get the, the funny signal from, <laughs> from the sign, <laughs> which I appreciate. I, I just want to just say again on behalf of, of myself and certainly the president, uh, the administration and and all of us uh, here today, I would like to thank you all for inviting me uh, to, to moderate this panel. I've, I've taken copious notes, and, and my staff will be much uh, saddened by the fact that I'll have <laughs> lots of questions for afterwards. But again, to extend my uh, admiration, uh, congratulations, and most importantly, my appreciation for uh, what you as champions and certainly heroes uh, for not only us but those to follow us. Uh, the president has called upon uh, all Americans uh, to serve this nation and their communities, and, and you really are uh, the paragons of that fundamental value of service. And for that, you deserve uh, our thanks at a minimum, uh, and certainly uh, lots more uh, beyond that. I think Champions of Change, at least from my perspective, does indeed represent the tide uh, that rises all boats. Uh, and so I think the more we can find ways to support the unique and innovative and creative ideas that you have not only here but across across the country, uh, the better off we'll all be. So with that, I will turn it back to you and, and thank you all very much. Thank you, Richard, uh, and thank you to the second panel. Uh, I thought it was a great discussion, and I know a lot of uh, our staff here in the room are taking notes and looking forward to the follow-up from this discussion. Um, I also want to thank our speakers and our moderators again for taking part in this event. Um, also, a special thank you to the FEMA staff who helped make all of this happen. Um, uh, but finally, I wanted to remind everyone here uh, in the audience and watching online uh, to learn more about our champions. Um, you can go to www.whitehouse.gov slash champions. Uh, to learn more about their stories and hopefully be inspired to do similar work in your communities. Uh, and before we go, I wanted to just give one last thank you uh, to our champions for their work uh, and for those doing the important work uh, like this around the country. So thank you very much. <laughs>